Good morning, welcome to Sports Radio 1310, The Ticket, George DiGiani Train Station Fitness Show. Here with my good friend, Jim Judd. He's a uh, nutritionist, clinical nutritionist. He's been on the show many times, and we're going to do somewhat of a follow-up show today. We haven't done it in, in quite a while. I might have only done this show once prior uh, when I wrote my book back in, I think it was 1998, called Three Minutes to a Strong Mind and Fit Body. And that topic today is artificial sweeteners opposed to sugar. Is one better than the other? I'll, 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 I'll present it in a different way, Jim. Is one <laughs> healthy and the other not? Or is one healthier than the other? Well, it, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, you, in, the, in the realm of artificial sweeteners, there is no healthy alternative, okay. period. End of story. Because artificial sweeteners will destroy your health. So are we also, are we also, uh, and we, I guess we can get into this later on, but are we also uh, uh, lumping in stevia and xylitol? No. Xylitol maybe, stevia no. I didn't think the, so. The, jury, the jury's still out on xylitol because of the changes that take place in the gut from xylitol. And you that's mean, evidenced you mean by the squirts? Yes, because a lot of you know a lot of people who use xylitol on a regular basis gastric have, have gastric yeah. disorder, and so when anytime there's changes occurring like that, um, it it comes under question. So what we'll discuss coming up next is the type of sweeteners that you're most likely familiar with, what they do in your body, what you're not aware of in mainstream media, and then why are some soda companies, or at least one. <laughs> Going back to sugar. Hold on, isn't sugar supposed to make us fat and it's got all these calories and it does this huge insulin release? Why are they going back to sugar? What's the skinny on artificial sweeteners? Coming up next, we'll talk with Jim Judd, 703 Sports Radio, 1310 The Ticket. 711 Sports Radio, 1310 The Ticket. George DiGiani, Train Station Fitness Show. Talking with Jim Judd, who's a clinical nutritionist, and we're discussing today artificial sweeteners, how they affect your body, which ones are possibly worse for you, why a soda company, and I won't mention who it is, or even other companies are going back to sugar, and a whole host of other things if we can get them in this hour. So let's, let's first look at why sugar gets a bad rap, other than calories, because there's high calories in fat also, how sugar affects us that's negative, but I think toward the end of the show, unless you want to mention it now, you're going to discuss kind of like the history of sugar and how that can benefit us as well. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting, George, and, and, and I love this topic because so often what people think they're doing that's good for their health is actually very detrimental to their health. Sure. And this is one of the areas that I, I believe is, is one of the, 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 the top of the heap as far as keeping Americans from experiencing optimal health. And it really goes back to the late 1800s because uh, most people don't realize this, but you know, at the time, sugar was becoming, in the late 1800s, early 19, uh, 1900s, sugar was becoming a staple in the diet for most Americans because it made things taste better. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to that, you know, once the shipping channels opened so that countries could export uh, you know, uh, beet sugar and cane sugar, those things that were starting to be mass produced at the time, doctors at that time you know, we're really on to that the overconsumption of sugar, and that's really where we get into it, it's overconsumption. The overconsumption of sugar could lead to, to diseases which were very rare at the time, like diabetes, which was almost unheard of, or obesity, which obesity was almost unheard of at the time, but there was talk of that. So there was a... Um, a Tell that to Henry VIII. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, he was exceptional, wasn't he? But um, the, uh, the, really the first artificial sweetener showed up in 1878, and it was based on a doctor that did some research to find an alternative to the consumption of sugar. And so he found it in a coal tar derivative. So the first artificial sweetener, which was saccharin, was actually extracted from coal tar and then isolated and found that it, had, that it was 100 times sweeter than sugar. What would make someone look for that in coal tar? Well, the doctors of the time were, uh, were stating, you know, that, that sugar consumption, not even, even small amounts of sugar, would lead to disease states. And so that alerted, you know, scientists have always been that way, looking for a different way to do something. Isn't it funny how the government will defer to science to get the answer they want, but when science produces a specific answer that 
will benefit us in some way if there's not anyone lobbying for it and there's no money to be made in it, there's no change. I, I, what, and I guess what I'm getting at is we often hear about information that's omitted from what we really need to know, such as saccharin and, and uh, uh, aspartame and other sweeteners that are, that are proven scientifically dangerous for us. Right. And it's not new news, it's just not in mainstream media. Right. And it's just, I understand when we talk about following the money, I just don't get how there's not been a documentary made today like there was with these fast food places and eating like food ink food ink yeah. right and, yeah. and and other ones it's just it's it's just really it's it's it gives me tired head i can't yeah. it's it's ineffable because there's no words for me to give to you or anyone else that's listening right now i can't wrap my mind around understanding the fact that we don't have all of this information that's in mainstream media like a little radio show like this has to produce this information and has to be an expose of, of really exposing these sort of things and and, and I, I agree with you and, and and we know I mean we could do a week of shows on why things get kept off a of front page that are really very important for us to do that but that's uh, that's one of the areas where lobbying and big pharma money will keep things out of the mainstream because it's a better better bottom line way to get that product out there and the taste is incredible now saccharin one of the things you brought to my attention and I, I recalled this only once I saw it was that saccharin was banned in 1977 correct because it was linked to bladder cancer in 1968 and it took that long to get it off the market and that's uh, but then there's the politics behind the whole scene of you know the um, uh, the uh, the attorney at the time that was um, that was fighting the um, uh, that, that was trying to get it off the market actually ended up becoming a board member for the company that was making the sure. product. Yeah, that um, you know that so, so it gets down to I mean you know at, at the end of the day people get paid to to jump the tracks and do something different. So let's talk about what's what we know scientifically that saccharin does for us. Actually, let's back up for a moment. Which products are saccharin in? Well, uh, saccharin, sa sa saccharin, which is the little pink package, right. um, it's, in, uh, it's in thousands of products, and, uh, and that's why in, in, my, in my practice, I always try to teach my clients, I'm like, read every single label of every single thing that goes in your mouth. And of course, you do. You know, I mean, you're, you're a label reader as well, and you know this. But I, like I tell them, I say, if you pick up a lemon, there's not an ingredients list on it right. because it's just a lemon. That's all it is. If you have to read a label and there's, you know, eight to ten different ingredients there, chances are you don't need to be eating it anyway. But it's, people do. It's my understanding that we don't even know all of the nutrients. Let's say in an apple, we have an idea of what they are, but you can't take take nutrients that you believe aren't an apple, put them in a pill, and now you say, well, this is an apple in a pill. Right. We don't, we don't even know every single thing that's in a food. It's only an idea of what we believe is in there. You can't break it down, put it in a pill, and say, okay, now here's an apple, unless you've literally processed that apple, mm -hmm. put it in a pill, and it preserved it in some way, and now when you've preserved it, unless you put it in a refrigerator, right. but now if you preserve it, you've put something else in there that it didn't have naturally... Yeah, right. That's right. So, what does saccharin? What do we know scientifically? Saccharin does for us. That's not being hidden anywhere. It's just that we're not looking for it, and it's not in mainstream news. The main thing, the the main thing that is really interesting uh, about uh, a product like saccharin, which again historically Monsanto was the manufacturer of, of saccharin. That is so surprising, in, Monsanto. <laughs> really? No, I'm talking like in the 1930s, back that wow. far. And so this was really their. Their, their product that took them you know to the top because it was starting to be manufactured and used in so many foods but originally saccharin was used by doctors to treat nausea and headache it just happened to have a sweet taste to it so that's when a very large manufacturer grabbed and said hey we can start giving this to everybody put it in foods put it in. and so it was used uh, abundantly when sugar was so expensive during World War mm -hmm. II saccharin was used in our for our troops uh, to sweeten foods that were going to them because it was so much cheaper to use than sugar because sugar was hard to get. So what does it do? What are some of the symptoms? I, just, I love the history of it. I, I like it also. What are yeah. some of the symptoms we can, if we're aware that we can 
notice or is it a cumulative effect and we might not be aware of those effects until it's too late yeah um on saccharin use it's <laughs> the, the two most common it's obesity and diabetes and the um uh, the evidence of that is is that you know look at the trend of our population here the trend of our population has been shifting from sodas that are sweetened with uh with cane sugar over to artificial sweeteners starting in the 1960s on through the 70s to where by this time, by the 1990s and, and in the 21st century, the, the, the predominantly selected soft drink is artificially sweetened. All so hold on, you board. just, I asked you what the evidence is. You know I hold people to the fire. What is the evidence that says saccharin is dangerous for us and what are the symptoms? And you said, well, the, 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 it's proven in obesity and diabetes. How do we know that saccharin is to blame for that specifically? Because in scientific studies, it's been proven that it interrupts the metabolic pathways in the body. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. Yeah. That's, that to me is more scientific. And actually causes a, uh, uh, as much of an insulin spike in the body as sugar does. But it does it in a very different way. So it, it's just following the pathways of what that what that compound or what that chemical is doing. So, so that, how are people that are knowledgeable like you getting on mainstream media that is nationwide and talking about what, when we look at these, these sugar substitutes, oh, well, it's not a big deal at all. It's this type of molecule and it's this type of molecule and you put these molecules together and that's what you have. And I remember Dr. I think it was Dr. Nancy Snyderman who even said that on, on whatever she's on Today Show or whatever the... the shows that she's mm -hmm. on yeah and, and and it just bothers me you have a medical doctor you have clinical nutritionists that are talking about it it not being a big deal oh it's just this and this mm -hmm. when they're not recognizing what that chemical response has in the substrate of events in your body and affecting what like you said your metabolic pathways yeah well and that's the thing that blows my mind is that you have an entire um you have an entire industry the uh, uh, uh you know the american diabetic association for instance promoting their patients with diabetes to use products that have a sweetener in them that actually causes type 2 diabetes. Who benefits? Are, are, are they getting some money from Monsanto to say that? Are they really that dumb? And I'm not trying to put anyone down, but I, if you have smart people running a company and you have people who are in, in the nutrition space that went to some of the same schools or have the same knowledge you do, how can they make these claims? and say, okay, you're diabetic, use this, that'll give you the same or a worse effect as sugar? That's the big question, George, that no one can really answer when you've got brilliant people that really just sort of turn, to, turn a blind eye to the facts that are right there in front of them in science. But these people care. Look, when you have someone who's part of... Well, I can't answer really why. I know you yeah, can't, yeah. but wait, this is just a, a conversation because you, you can tell I'm passionate about, I really care about people, and it bothers me when you have someone who leaves a certain profession or they leave their home to start a, 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 a direction they feel they need to go in life to help people. And well, one example is someone goes to school and they become a doctor. Why do you become a doctor? You become a doctor just for the money? No, mostly you become a doctor because you want to help people. Right. But then you're held to certain standards once you take that oath and you start practicing that if you, that if you jump tracks and you practice in a different way than what they're than what they're bound to practice. That's why it's very difficult for mainstream doctors to, to, to move into any kind of nutraceuticals or natural practice because the AMA will get all over them for it. Why does it have to be natural instead of saying to the patient, look, I know that, let's say it's the Diabetic Association, right. okay? Someone's a diabetic, they go there, and they say, look, my doctor's recommended all these things for me, I should eat these things, and it has you know, this in it, and, then, and the nutritionist at the Diabetic Association says, hey, by the way, this has saccharin in it, and we know what it does to the body, this is not good for you to have. Why don't they interrupt that and say, this is what we know it does, here's the proof, and empower them to make their own decision? I think, you know, and, and George, you have to look at the hypnotic ability of, of the, of the of marketing. big food, big, of, yeah, absolutely, big food and big pharma, the hypnotic ability of that, of like, this is safe, this is natural, this is not going to hurt you, this is, you know, that's very hypnotic, even to very brilliant people. I mean, that's that's something that, that still surprises me, that, that a doctor, 
you know, who is that trained, a dietitian that is that trained, will sit there with someone and say, this is safe to use, it's only four calories, and this is much better for you than sugar. Are they I, just not going into the research? They're not going into the research or the evidence, the, or where the where where the information is coming from with them you know because we can get all into the you know genetically modified issues and such as that when you have you know commercials that are run you know that that show I mean look at the pharmaceutical industry look, look at the commercials that are run on TV to promote a new drug look what they look like they're cartoons that you know that that, that have but music that playing. should not be affecting people such as yourself it does I, well I it affects everybody. It affects you, George. It I mean, affects me, but it's, yeah. if, if you're it's a scientist, <laughs> if you're a scientist, you should be looking at the science, not what's on TV, and, and giving people information and that not, is real. And not be paid off by a company. Did you, so, or do you think the training. Dietetic Association is paid off by Monsanto? That's what I'm saying. Who's being paid off for the dietetic and other... Well, other here, uh, organizations yeah, that are it, supposedly looking out for our best gosh, interest. Gosh, I love I love this conversation because at the uh, at at the at the National Clinical Nutrition Conference this year, do you know who the number one financial contributor to that conference was? Camel cigarettes. McDonald's. Oh. And that big question came up is like the the board who approves that. How did a company like McDonald's actually get to be the number one? supporter or the number one sponsor of this year's clinical nutrition conference. I'll tell you, they sell salads. 725 Sports Radio 1310, the ticket. 734 Sports Radio 1310, the ticket. George DiGiani, Train Station Fitness Show, my friend Jim Judd in the studio, clinical nutritionist. And we're discussing uh, artificial sweeteners today, how they affect your health, why it's not in mainstream media, why professionals are telling you you should have so substitutes such as saccharin or even aspartame, why aren't they taking this off the market? As a matter of fact, years ago, uh, when I wrote my book, I, had, I interviewed Dr. H.J. Roberts, who's the leading expert on aspartame poisoning or aspartame disease. Uh, there's different ways to refer to it. And how it has all of these detrimental effects to your health. And it was in uh, over 5,000 products at the time. And now you'll see a lot of products that say... Uh, that it doesn't have this uh, right. No uh, aspartame. No that's aspartame in it. Now. Right. Yeah. But it's still an equal because that's what equal is made of. Right. Right. So talk about what you know about aspartame. Formaldehyde when it hits a certain temperature, especially when the body warms it up. <laughs> uh, stro not stroke. Uh, headaches. Weight gain. Uh, convulsions. Yes. Yeah. Or seizures rather. You know, uh, uh, and, and George, aspartame is what's called chemically a methyl ester. And it, I mean, so uh, that's just like the first clue. You know, it's like it's a methyl ester, and what do methyl esters do? They just have they have two amino acids. One is aspartic acid, and the other is phenylalanine. But you're absolutely right. Methyl esters cascade once they're in your body to make methane. They start making methane in your gut. Methane can then travel on down and cascade into the formation of formaldehyde mm -hmm. in the body. Now that's for people who are who have certain gut issues. Like for instance, people do, who don't have a lot of the, you know, a lot of good bacteria in their gut will start me, me, manufacturing methane and formaldehyde in their system because they don't have the good bacteria to offset that. Well, that's most of the I'm population. Just going to right say that's most people. Yeah, it's most of the population because they're not getting the bacteria, the fermented foods in their diet that they need to to make that good bacteria, which would be uh, more yogurt, more kefir, more sauerkraut. What's anything, kefir? Kefir is a, um, it's it's like yogurt, but it's more like a drink. Mm -hmm. and it's a soured milk product, and you can get organic uh, kefir that's actually uh, flavored with uh, uh, with fruit, and it's it's delicious. But you know, you, you know, when you look at the um, when you look at the cultures around the globe that have the the most longevity, they're the cultures that have the most fermented foods in their diet. Mm. Whether it's Asian, whether it's European, mm. those cultures that live the longest have the most fermented food. In their so diet. not only do they have the most fermented food, but they also use. I, I was doing a lot of research on soy uh, maybe five years ago, and the Asian population who has soy has about a third of the amount of soy that we consume, first of all. Yeah. They have, we, grow, we, we grow the most right. in the world. They have, um, their soy is natural, and it's in its natural state, so you have tofu and soybeans and soy sauce and, 
everything that's fermented. But what we tend to believe out here, and I know I'm getting off topic for a moment, but just stick with me. Yeah, we'll jump right back to it. It's important information. That when you have anything soy that's that's not in its fermented natural state, it is actually damaging to your health. Soy ice cream, soy milk, soy anything you can possibly think of is damaging. Why? Because it's not soy anymore. You lost all the nutrients. It's been heated so high, it's now carcinogenic. It can cause cancer. Oh, by the way, it has. it's not animal products. So I'm a vegan, so I'll go ahead and have yeah, soy. Yeah, so, so I'm going to live forever. I'm yeah. healthy. <laughs> right. So there's all that. Yeah. But, but going back to aspartame for yeah. a moment and how that affects the body. Is there new information since 98 or 99 that we are, is, is more mainstream that we're aware of? Well, I think, I think today people uh, have that question mark that comes up and they're looking for it now because they've started to hear through, um, you, know, you know, I mean, we, we have access now to any kind of information, right. you know, that we didn't have back in the 90s. So people are, are more aware of chemical artificial sweeteners. Just the term now, artificial sweetener, you know, causes a light bulb to go off in people's heads, and that's why you see that companies, companies, soft drink companies, yeah. that that their biggest sellers are artificially sweetened mm -hmm. soft drinks, now have uh, what they call an alternative. Our alternative drink, though, is the soft drink that's sweetened naturally with real sugar. Right. You know, and so it's like, why do you think they're jumping on that bandwagon? Because they know that people are wanting to get away from artificial sweeteners. Well, but I think they're also of, doing it, just to stay on that topic for a moment, I think they're also doing it to mitigate any potential risk of lawsuits. Uh, so a new documentary don't you is... Just a, know it. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're really being strategic, in my opinion, because a oh, new absolutely. documentary will be released about these dangers of these, these, these toxins. They're not just natural sweeteners. They're not... Just artificial sweeteners, but they're toxins. Yeah, I mean it's no. It, I mean it, it's no surprise, George. You know that that, that that people in these in high level positions that are supposed to you know give the give the green light, go ahead with it. Yeah. You know because Cerro Laboratories was you know FDA approved the use of aspartame, which Cerro Laboratories was marketing at the time in 1974. They approved it for food use at that that it was completely safe. When? In 1974, it was found earlier than that. But it was found it? way earlier than yeah. that. But it was it was approved yeah. because, you know, saccharin had the big market right. share at the time. You know, Aspir the, the Cerro Laboratories wanted the market share, so you know they they threw saccharin under the bus, saying it's cancer causing. Well, the commissioner of the FDA at the time, and this is a quote from the commissioner of the FDA at the time when the FDA approved the use of aspartame manufactured by Cerro Laboratories. He said that Searle's studies on aspartame were, quote, poorly conceived, carelessly executed, and inaccurately analyzed and reported. But that let's the, go ahead and let make it safe for, that, the, that, for everybody that, anyway. That, that was the, that was the, the commissioner of the FDA's right. statement about aspartame at the time. But when you've got companies... But it was approved like, why? Like, I mean, I know like, we know why, but why was it approved? Well, because they threw enough money at right. it to get to you know to get the they even uh, took it to the Justice Department to open a grand jury investigation on it. At that time, now when you think about it, why would that go on and then and become right. the number one selling artificial sweetener? Now, what's really interesting is that that commissioner went on to be on the board of on the advisory board for Sterile Laboratory. And so you think so. So of course the guy, you know, the guy was paid off, mm -hmm. and he was put into their manufacturing facility as, as one of their spokespeople. Mm -hmm. So you know, and that's hard for people to wrap their brains around that, that someone that, would be so unethical, absolutely, to do that. You know, yes. or that these are that these trusted, you know, uh, you know, organizations like the FDA mm -hmm. don't they have my best interest? You know, absolutely don't they know? Not. You know, I mean, they're, they're 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 paid off. That's what makes me wonder sometimes when an FDA commissioner, you know, who is a who's a brilliant scientist, will jump on the bandwagon with a pharmaceutical company that's been called on the carpet for so many deaths occurring from the use of their drug. It's One the thing that thing you brought food. to my attention is that aspartame is responsible for tumor acceleration. That was discovered that it was in brain tumor acceleration, and that I mean that that's already been proven. Has it? it? Yeah, that, I mean that, that has been scientifically proven. But let's keep eating it because you know it's the FDA has our best interest. You at know, heart. it's like the cigarette. You know, it's like the tobacco mm -hmm. industry. You know, when they were called up for all the chemical additives that they were putting into the tobacco instead of just selling tobacco and you know it, everything on there, it was like, well, of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. Well, of course it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, over and over and over and over and over and over until finally they had to go. Well, of course it does. Right. You know, and now we're just going to start sort of backpedaling and we'll go ahead and put some uh, some information out there to keep people from starting smoking. I did not have relations with that woman. 
Exactly. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, well, yeah. So it, and, and so that's why I think it's really important for people like you, George, and for me to get on and say, I didn't have relations with her. No. <laughs> but you probably had relations with an artificial sweetener. Yes, I am that type of guy. Somewhere along the line. <laughs> so sucralose, super, super fast, because I want to get into something else I teased during the week, how, how we can use a natural substance instead of something that is uh, uh, um, medically approved, if you will. Right, FDA, uh, FDA claims approved, that it's safe for safe, consumption. For, safe for us. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, just, just blanket, if you would, sucralose, because one of the things that's understood by people who are novice in the nutritional world is anytime you see on a product OSE, that is that natural form of sugar, and it means sugar, O-S-E, right? right? Uh -huh. yeah. But when we Galactose, see... Galactose, maltose, sucralose. Su sucralose. No, I'm, I'm sucralose. Sucralose, sorry. Right, but when We're we see sucralose, sucralose. Yeah. you shared something with me I thought was interesting. Why is sucralose not a natural sugar? Why is it not good for us? Well, because it's broken down to, uh, uh, and, and then chemicals are added to it to, to make it what it will, that sweet taste, which is, you know, 300 times sweeter than, than table mm -hmm. sugar. You have to chemically alter it in, in order to make it do that. And when you chemically alter it, it goes into our body and does what? It, uh, well, I'll, I'll just go down the list here very quickly of the things that it can cause whenever you ingest sucralose. And now, if you ingest it one time, most likely you won't have any symptoms of this. But, but what's happening is, is that sucralose is now in a thousand food products wow. that all over the grocery store sucralose is in. And it's, you know, it's got the, the, the beautiful labeling on it. But when you consume it on a daily basis in some food that you're eating, in some food or beverage, uh, the, the side effects that are associated with sucralose use are allergic reactions, blurred vision, dizziness, elevated blood sugar and insulin. Hello. Mm. The American Diabetics Association is promoting the use of sucralose for diabetics, but it actually raises blood sugar levels, gastrointestinal problems, migraines, seizures, and weight gain. So what I want to Wait, do coming, yeah. out, not, coming up next is... It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, and, and then, before we go, you have my mind going, and now obviously my mouth isn't catching up, because what I'm thinking about right away is, for those of you who try to eat really well and exercise, and you wonder why you're not losing weight, or you're maintaining your weight, or even gaining weight, and you, and you want to throw your hands up in the air and say, my God, why am I even doing this? You may not be aware of the toxins that are in your body that are preventing you from losing weight, such as some of these artificial sweeteners. You might be eating really healthy or think you're eating healthy and you're trying and, you're, and you say, well, oh my God, I'm not eating like this person who has 150 pounds to lose. I only have 30 or 40 pounds to lose. Well, this might be one of the contributing factors. Coming up next, uh, Jim Judd's going to discuss the uh, sweetener we should use and also how aspirin is not as, well, let me change the, the wording of that. How a certain healthy natural nutrient is just as beneficial for lowering stroke as if you were to use aspirin, but it has no detrimental effects on the body. What is that? We'll talk more with Jim Judd coming up next and tell you what that is. 745 Sports Radio 1310, the ticket. 754 Sports Radio 1310, the ticket. George DiGiani, train station fitness show. Discussing sugar today and how it affects the body, but we're more about artificial sweeteners. That was what the basis of the show was. Right now, we're going to shift a little bit and talk about the sugar substitute that, or sugar itself, that would be beneficial for you. Go ahead. Oh, the, the sugars that I like uh, promoting out there are coconut palm sugar. Very easy to find. It's in a powder form. You can bake with it. Maple sugar and maple syrup, and I always look for grade B. Or, and, and, you know, a lot of times, like, like I was sitting with a client yesterday, and she said, oh, I love using maple syrup. You know, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, you know, are you using maple syrup? Well, of course I'm using maple syrup. I said, what brand are you using? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the one, the, you know, the, 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 the Kroger brand, you know. And I said, you know, go, go home and call me back. Mm -hmm. right. You know, there's no syrup in it. It's corn syrup that's right. fla with maple flavoring. So I try to tell people, you know, read the labels. If it says, you know, uh, if, it's, if it says uh, that, it's, uh, that it's maple syrup, you know, it's from the grocery store, chances are it's not, but make sure you get real maple syrup, preferably grade B, because grade B has more of the mineral content in it that you need. So I love using uh, coconut palm sugar, maple sugar, molasses are great. Our grandmothers used to cook with molasses, has a very high mineral content, especially black strap molasses, which our grandparents grew up on, very high in iron. Uh, natural iron that your body will absorb naturally has a great uh, great flavor to it I love mixing like for kids if you mix a little 
uh, of organic blackstrap molasses with their peanut butter. They go crazy for it. Really? It's, but the interesting thing is that is that molasses actually promotes good pro probiotic health in the gut. It promotes good bacteria. Also, like to use um, use raw honey. I mean, uh, raw honey is still one of my favorite things because I mean, it historically goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of but years. But you have the diabetics that are listening. We talked about this earlier, and now now they kind of feel. I'm sure they feel like, well, hold on. If I can't use saccharin, I can't use aspartame. I can't use these. Uh, artificial sweeteners that are causing these issues in my body giving me more of an insulin spike than if I were to use sugar what am I supposed to do now well you know when, whenever we ingest uh, sugar um, um, you know a signal is sent to the pancreas you know to uh, to release more insulin to mop up the elevated glucose in there as long as you have adequate min uh, mineral intake which is all those all those great minerals of magnesium potassium iron calcium as long as we have an abundance of that in our body we're naturally going to process that uh, in, in a good way. And that comes from those sugars that you talked about, the raw honey, the black Correct. strap molasses, the, the vitamin, yeah. I mean the grade B uh, uh, maple grade, syrup. Grade B maple syrup, yeah. Right. All of these things because they work systemically in your body, mm -hmm. throughout the body causing all sorts of responses, where whenever you use an artificial sweetener uh, that, that are unnatural substances that we ingest, the um, uh, they they disrupt those energy producing processes. Okay, real fast. Yeah. I, I talked about this during the week. I want to yes. make sure we get it in. You just mentioned some of the minerals, and you talked about potassium. Yes. So on the potassium train, you said to me, and I thought it was really important for this type of sh for this show especially, that potassium lowers stroke risk as much as aspartame does, and uh, I mean aspirin. Aspirin does. Well, it Let's does it in a different that. way, because right. because I, I, I do like aspirin. I think right. aspirin is you know it, it, it dates back you know to um, um, you know to the the twenties and thirties, and it's uh, it's probably of any of the medication OTC medications out there probably the safest. So I do, but I don't think we necessarily need to be using aspirin on a daily basis in the eighty one milligram form, baby aspirin, just to thin your blood. I mean that's. Uh, uh, that's heavily promoted right now, but there's a downside to that daily staple use of that. Where, when we daily staple use potassium, which is K, and now the, you know... The, At what level? What which, uh, milligrams per day? You know, I, I, I like for people to get, uh, you know, if you look in the diet normally, if you were eating the right amount of fruits and vegetables and they were organically grown, because when you have, and this is the part for organics that I love, when you consume vegetables and fruits that have chemical pesticides and fertilizers on them, it destroys the potassium in that it, it actually fills them up with So sodium, how much should people have every day? About 200 milligrams. 200 That's it? to 400 milligrams normally of potassium. If you're an athlete, you want to get six to 800 milligrams of potassium. What if you're using potassium. it for the benefits of aspirin? How much do you want to use? 400 day? to 800 milligrams. 400 yeah. to 800 milligrams because of potassium a day if you're a person who's trying to get the benefits of aspirin without the detrimental effects of daily use of aspirin, correct? Correct. correct. In fact, those with the highest potassium intake in a study had a 20% lower risk of stroke. Now that's phenomenal. What is what what does aspirin prof uh, profess to have? Uh, they, that, that wasn't quoted in the uh, in the research article that I was um, uh, that I was that I was stating. Now the um, uh, it's it's you know my bottom line is turn to nature, turn to nature for what you want. On that, if you're trying to reduce your trans chances of stroke, all of the research is there, all of the clinical evidence is there. The potassium helps to do that. Now, one of the things, because so many people are on high blood pressure medications today, it actually lowers your potassium in your body. So you want to take in those foods and supplements that actually increase that potassium if you're on a high blood pressure. Jim medication. Judd, wealth of knowledge today. Once again, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, well, How can people get it? George, I enjoy it. You can go to nutritionalprofiles.com. And that's uh, nutritional profiles with an S dot com. And uh, send us an email, reach out, I'll answer your question. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. I enjoy it.